You know, there's this idea, I think is Malcolm Gladwell about how if you spend like 10,000 hours doing something, you become like really, really expert. It sounds like at this point, you've probably put in about that many hours if you add up like all the times performing in Washington Square Park and then all the time. Um, is that fair to say? I mean, your younger brothers, it seems like they started out very young as well. Um, you guys must be like incredibly veteran um, musicians and performers at this point. Do you believe in the 10,000 hour principle or something like it? I do believe in the 10,000 hour principle, but I believe in it for every bit of it. Meaning if you're a writer and you're writing your own music, you need to put 10,000 hours into writing. If you're just going to play, you need to put 10,000 hours into playing. If you want to, you know, figure out the branding and marketing and the messaging of something, you need to put 10,000 hours into that. So the music industry is so much more than just making a song and putting it out. There's so many other pieces that go into it. But yeah, I'm a big believer in, in paying your dues and putting in your time. Welcome back to Yang Speaks. I'm Zach Grauman, your co-host. Every once in a while in Yang Speaks, we get a treat. And today is a treat. Andrew said after he recorded this, he's like, I think this is one of the best episodes we ever did, which is a good, pretty good bar. So today, Adam met from the band AJR. And if you don't know what AJR is, you're old. But they're actually really, really talented. And Adam is just an awesome guy. He's got this fun career and he is really, really devoted to climate change and very, very, um, frankly, well educated on the topic, particularly for how young he is. So you've got an incredible artist and someone who's really trying to uh, make the world a better place talking to Andrew, um, who's always trying to make the world a better place. And you end up with a very fascinating conversation about uh, the music industry and also how we can fix the planet. So don't miss this episode. Adam Met from AJR on Yank Speaks right now. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the podcast world famous musician, one of the, well, the oldest brother in AJR uh, and uh, international environmental activist, Adam Met. Welcome to the podcast, Adam. Andrew, I'm so excited to be here. Great to see you. We are so excited to have you, Adam. Holy cow, man. When I met you uh, last year, I was like, wait a minute, this guy's a rock star getting his PhD in what? <laughs> <laughs> Some of those things didn't really compute. So I guess we'll we'll dig into the rock star part first, and then we'll we'll go towards what you're working on now. Um, but uh, even the story of AJR, and for those of you who, who don't know, you really should just, uh, you know, like Spotify AJR or YouTube music AJR. Um, I had this uh, this joke, and you saw it on Twitter, Adam, where uh, I mentioned it to my young staffer uh, th um, that you and I might speak. And then he was like, oh, what are they sing?" And then we started playing the songs from AJR, and he was like, that's them, that's them too. <laughs> <laughs> so it behaved like o over and over again. So I'd encourage anyone listening to this who's like, like who's AJR, who's Adam Met? Just go ahead and uh, have that experience because you'll find out that um, they, they, they sing half a dozen of the songs that you've uh, like rocked out to <laughs> in, in the car or, or elsewise. Getting to that place where, you know, you're a bunch of songs versus a household name. It's something, you know, every artist is trying to figure out how do you become like Imagine Dragons as opposed to three different songs that are by Imagine Dragons. So it's something we're working on right now. Well, you're somewhere between a bunch of songs and Imagine Dragons in my mind. There, I mean, there's certainly a bulk of people for whom, you know, you are a household name. I I'm fascinated by your story uh, because you grew up here in New York. Your parents are architects, so it's not like you're showbiz kids. And then you and your two younger brothers just start making music. And then you make music on the streets of New York. Like, uh, for whatever reason, this does not compute to, uh, to pop star or rock star. So can you talk about your... Uh, like when you and your brothers were just messing around like in the living room? Yeah, it, it actually started with our dad because our dad was a huge music fan, especially of music from the 60s and 70s. So he would play us some vinyl growing up of Simon and Garfunkel and the Beach Boys and even like Peter, Paul and Mary. 
and we started replicating the harmonies just around the house that we would hear on those vinyls. And then we said, okay, let's take this out and see what happens if we go into Washington Square Park, because we grew up right near Washington Square Park, and street performing culture is such a big thing there. I mean, you go out now into the park and you see puppet shows and people doing flips over each other and some jazz bands. And it was just part of the normal culture of growing up in Manhattan. Let's see if this is a thing. Let's see if people will actually stop when they're on their way to work and hear us sing. And people stopped. We had a hat out and Jack, my youngest brother, he was either seven or eight when we first no. started. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So he's eight. How yeah. old are you during, during the, this debut? Uh, I was 14 or 15. Okay. So you're the older brother and then, uh, and then there's a younger brother who's like eight and then there's a middle brother who's maybe like 11 at this time or like, what, what's that? Yeah. 11 or 12. Yep. All right. So my natural instinct is that you must've been the ringleader because I have an older brother and he was definitely the person who did stuff first. And then after he did it, I followed. So uh, were you the person who was like, hey, guys, you want to go out to the park? And, <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I could claim, you know, the leadership role. But it, funny enough, it was all three of us. Like all three of us had really specific kind of different interests in music. And uh, it all kind of came together into this thing where we all have our own roles that have continued to now. Um, and. I guess it was me who said, you know, you take this and you take this and we'll carry it out to the park kind of thing. But in terms of the interest in actually doing the music, it really was equal. I didn't have to force them to do it at all. <laughs> well, it, cer it certainly seems like you all have a very deep, innate interest in, in music. Uh, so you go out there, you have a few instruments, like you, you were on guitar and, and singing, I think, and then your brothers were, were had other instruments. And so... What kind of feedback does one get? And then do you measure your success based on, frankly, how much money people put in the hat? <laughs> and, and, and what do your parents think about this at the time? Do, are they cool with the three of you just being out in the park um, uh, doing this? Uh, like, do they feel any need to chaperone you? Like, uh, is there anything there? So the second part of the question, our parents chaperoned just about every time. And some of some of the time we did it, you know, not following the rules exactly, because technically you're supposed to have a license when you have amplified music. And some of the times we <laughs> didn't actually have the license we were supposed to. Um, so, you know, our mom came by and, and she, you know, talked to the police officers and the police officers were, you know, you're supposed to have a license. And she would go, oh, no, he's eight years old. He didn't know there's supposed to be a license. <laughs> so she, she kind of took on that role. And then eventually we started having a, a license every time we did it. But measuring success, that that's a really good question because in the moment, we measured the success in terms of how much money we would get. And once in a while, somebody would throw like a 20 in the hat and we would be so excited. Sometimes people <laughs> threw rocks in the hat and that was not very exciting. Sometimes people tried to steal the microphones from us and that was not exciting. But I guess, you know, retrospectively, the success from that time was learning how to perform in front of an audience that didn't care about you at all. Because that's what you get in street performing. You have to convince people that don't want you to be there to stop and take a moment and listen and give you money. So now we don't get nervous at all when we go on stage now, because that was the most nervous you could possibly be, you know, putting out this janky little speaker that doesn't really work well, trying to convince people to stop and listen to you sing. And we also tap danced at that time in order to try and get people's attention. Wait, wait, um, does that but, mean you had a little... Um, a little floor and tap shoes in order to make the sounds? Oh, yes. Yep. We had a little wooden board that we would put out and all three of us tap dance. And in, in a previous life, I, uh, I taught tap dance for, for quite a while in New York. Wow. So that means you still must have some very fancy footwork, right? I mean, if anyone did that at any point in their life, <laughs> they could still probably do some things. We may or may not be including a little bit of it the next time we go on tour. Wow. Well, another reason to go check out AJR in tour, which I, I think I was going to come to this a little bit later, but we might as well discuss it since you brought it up. Are you guys on tour right now? <laughs> Let's go ahead. And, and I wanted to ask about this in part because, frankly, it's like post-pandemic Rock concerts are back. What does that look like? What does the industry look like? The industry is a little bit rough right now. We played our first show about a week ago in, uh, was the first show in about a year and a half. 
Um, and it was it was a really good show. And if this was a year and a half ago, it would have been a fine show. But the fact that it was the first one back, it actually felt really amazing to play in front of an audience. And it was it was a college show that we did down in Annapolis. And it was the first one back, and the next one we have isn't until July. So when you ask if we're on tour again, we have a bunch of one-off shows. We have some festivals that we're playing this summer. But to me, touring is getting in a tour bus, waking up in a different city every day, like loading into an amphitheater or an arena, and you know, playing for five to ten thousand of our own fans. And unfortunately, that's not really gonna happen until next year, April of next year, because we wanted to to make sure that every single person could come to our shows, meaning, you know, kids all the way through grandparents, because we have such a wide range of people that come to the show. And we want to make sure every single person can get the vaccine before before we start touring again. So let's talk about this one show you did where you say it's a good show and it would have been a good show like 18 months ago. Like what what was the venue? What was the capacity like? It sounds like it was a college show. So it was, uh, you know, like college students like, yeah, what does that look like? It was at the U.S. Navy Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. So it was a completely locked down campus. We needed to get, you know, COVID tests before we went in. And everyone was wearing masks in the audience. And when we got there, we thought everyone was going to be seated and all six feet apart in these chairs and there was going to be no energy in the crowd. But because everyone had to get negative tests or have a vaccine, it was a mosh pit the entire time. It was probably, I don't know, two to 3,000 cadets. Um, they're called midshipmen, which I learned. Um, They'd probably be they pretty fired just, up. Yeah, if you were like a two to 3,000 cadets at one of like the first, uh, you know, live concerts in <laughs> <laughs> over here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and it was just a party. And the, the crazy thing is our song Bang, which got really big last year, we never got to play it live in front of an audience. This was the very wow. first time. And it was, wow. you know, a top 10 song on the Billboard sure. 100. So a lot of people knew it. And we couldn't really measure if people knew it or it just, you know, looked like people knew it based on the numbers. So the fact that they were singing the song back to us and this was the first time we heard it, it was, it was quite a moment. All right, want to talk to you guys about BetterHelp, which is our sponsor on Yang Speaks. I think most people lost their mind during COVID. I personally did. And one of my, I call it my steam valve, is my BetterHelp time once a week. So I meet with my counselor, basically just helps me blow off steam in a really healthy way. I just talk about things I never really talk about, and it's great. And it's needed right now to say, hey, what the heck is happening in the world and talk about what we're all going through, what you personally are going through, whether it's depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, grief, self-esteem, you name it. For me, it's helping focus my ambition and understand how I react to certain things in the world. It's awesome. I love it. I look forward to it every week. So here's the deal. I want you to start living a happier life today. I want you to check out BetterHelp. And as a listener, you're going to get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash yang. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash yang. So let's return to the you and your young brother is playing in front of people that don't care about you uh, in in New York, and uh, I think a lot of people in New York can relate to that. Like you know, because you walk around, and there are people performing, and it's not like you like stop it and be like, oh, <laughs> like what's going on here? Like you know, a lot of time just walk on by. I'm going to share a story where I feel like I can relate to that because I ran for president. <laughs> you did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I did. So there, uh, there was like an extended period, let's call it 2018, when I was running for president and no one cared. And so you would go and th there would be these uh, different types of venues. So like if I were to, to speak in front of like a, a group of sort of curious uh, friends of friends or whatnot, um, then that was one dynamic. Uh, we had uh, our own mini tour, which uh, drew a certain number of people. And that was a different dynamic. But the dynamic that may reminded me of what you described was that I would speak in these political gatherings in Iowa and New Hampshire, where uh, they had Democratic clubs who would bring various candidates in. 
and uh, people did not care about Andrew Yang, uh, sort of novelty presidential candidate in those venues. Uh, you know, I was there typically as part of a program. There might be a few other speakers. Let's call them uh, Jeff Merkley and uh, Tulsi Gabbard and maybe Jay Inslee or people like that. So I, I'd be like the least uh, attractive, <laughs> shall we say, like of of these speakers where it's like, Andrew Yang, what? Like entrepreneur, what? Um, and so there, there was a lot of talking to people who did not care. Uh, and uh, there, there was like some um, strengthening to that. Um, you're right. Where later when people did care, you were like, oh, wow, like this is <laughs> like this is better. <laughs> like, that is interesting. But you kind of get used to people not caring and it does toughen you up. Yeah, I feel like the, the parallels there are so strong because even when we were performing on the street, we didn't have a Twitter. We didn't have an Instagram. It was just in the moment for people to hear what we were saying. And then when we started going on tour, our first show ever was in New Jersey and three people showed up. Literally three people showed three up. Three people, man. The dude, one person showed up to my first event in New Hampshire. It's like coffee with the candidate. <laughs> there was like one person. I just ended up like, you know, talking to other people in the cafe who had no idea who I was. Um, so when, when was this first show of yours? Like, uh, how, how old were you? We're going to use your age as the chronology. So you like start out in the park at, at 14 or 15. How old were you when this first show happened? I was born in 90. So in 2012, you were 22. I was 22. When you're 18, you go to college at Columbia, which happens to be my alma mater, uh, um, and my wife's alma mater, actually. Um, so very handy that you go to Columbia because that means you can still hang out and play music with your brothers. Um, though, though I will say that, frankly, I'm just going to lay this out for you, Adam. If you're a college guy, it sounds pretty lame to be going home to play music with your brothers when there's all of that college stuff going on and socializing. So what the heck does that look like? That's a great question. Um... I was I was a lame nerd. I was a lame nerd, <laughs> and I am. I was. That's proud a good of answer. Then. Good answer, Adam. Good answer. I'm proud of it now. So <laughs> it ended up working out in the long run. So oh yeah, it certainly did. <laughs> no that, that's for sure. Um, so tell us about your your college schedules. So you're in classes. Columbia is pretty rigorous. Um, so did you uh, go home? Did first? I mean, you did. You might have even lived at home. I guess there's a possibility because that would have been a money saver. There was one semester where I did end up living at home, but the rest of the time I lived on campus. And my middle brother, Ryan, for my last semester at school, that was his first semester, so we overlapped. And that was the semester that Hurricane Sandy happened. And the funny story about that is um, our home down in Chelsea, where we grew up, lost power during Hurricane Sandy. So he came over to my dorm room from his dorm room up at Columbia because Columbia still had power because, you know, it's a little bit higher than than Chelsea. And during Hurricane Sandy, we recorded the vocals for our first song that became a platinum record, which was a song called I'm Ready. And that was done in Harmony Hall on 110th Street in my dorm room in the middle of Hurricane Sandy. And that's what kicked everything off. Wow. I'll tell you, I've got a Hurricane Sandy story too, which is that my uh, oldest son was born during Hurricane Sandy. Um, So we remember it very well. He was a bit early because when the pressure changes, apparently all babies want to be born. (laughs) So what a big, what a big night that was. Sandy, like you make your first platinum record. I become a dad. Um, So how did your music look during the, the first few years of your being in college before your brother shows up? Our music during that time was terrible because when we were in the park, we were mostly doing covers of other people. But when I was in college, we experimented with a lot of different genres. So that's music that is never going to see the light of day. We have all of that in our, you know, on our hard drives. But we would spend, you know, six months working on song that was music that sounded very musical theater. And then we would spend six months working on music that was very hip hop focused. And Ryan, my middle brother, rapped on a couple of songs and those will definitely never come out. Um, But then we did some songs that were more like Simon and Garfunkel folk. And it took all of that time over those four years to say, okay, we want to bring a little bit of this genre in a little bit of this genre, a little bit of this genre until we actually found our sound. And 
that's one of the things when when other newer artists are asking us for advice, we say, take the time to explore what you want your sound to be. Because if you write a song and then put out your first song, if that's not what you want to be, you're, you're throwing something out there that you've now established yourself. This is the sound that you have. So take some time to really figure out who you want to be as an artist. And that's what we did when I was in college. So I would go home and we would play and we would write and we would record things. And like I said, most of it is terrible. And most of it's going to be terrible in the beginning because you're just learning how to do it. But we took that time to figure out, okay, this is what AJR sound is. This is what we want to communicate with our lyrics. And then when we started putting stuff out for real, then we had a concrete idea of, okay, this is the path we want to go down. So how many hours a week would you go play or make music with your brothers when you were in college? Maybe 10 to 12 hours a week. Um, I would go home and I would always, you know, combine it with bringing laundry home for my parents to do my laundry when I would, you know, go do That's me, or, or make them make me dinner or something like that. So then my, my next question is about your brother applying to college because he ends up getting into Columbia. It sounds like uh, it was during your final semester at Columbia and his first semester at Columbia, um, then your younger brothers in, in high school that you make your first hit. Uh, and it probably takes a bit of time for it to become a hit. But yeah, what is the process? You write this song and then how does it get out into the world and what happens next? So we wrote this song in the fall of 2012. And this was the the either the end of the our career or the beginning of our career. And I'll explain what I mean by that. We decided that we had written so many songs and we had, you know, tested them out on YouTube and SoundCloud and, and places like that. And we decided, OK, if this one doesn't do anything, then we're just going to pause. We're really just going to focus on school and get a real job. What? <laughs> Sorry. Wow. This is very, very high stakes here, Adam. <laughs> yeah. um, but, well, before we see we, we before we, we get to that. Um, you know, there's this idea, I think is Malcolm Gladwell about how if you spend like 10,000 hours doing something, you become like really, really expert. It sounds like at this point, you've probably put in about that many hours if you add up like all the times performing in Washington Square Park and then all the time. Um, is that fair to say? I mean, your younger brothers, it seems like they started out very young as well. Um, you guys must be like incredibly veteran um, musicians and performers at this point. Do you believe in the 10,000 hour principle or something like it? I do believe in the 10,000 hour principle, but I believe in it for every bit of it. Meaning if you're a writer and you're writing your own music, you need to put 10,000 hours into writing. If you're just going to play, you need to put 10,000 hours into playing. If you want to, you know, figure out the branding and marketing and the messaging of something, you need to put 10,000 hours into that. So the music industry, and I'm sure we can talk about this more, but is so much more than just making a song and putting it out. There's so many other pieces that go into it. But yeah, I'm a big believer in, in paying your dues and putting in your time. Okay, so back to 2012, you have this uh, hit song and you're like, okay, guys, if this thing doesn't work out, maybe we should go become management consultants or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yep. That was, that was, that was, that was, I mean, I made that up. But um, so, so what is the process through which this music gets out in the world? So it all happened during a psychology class at Columbia. So I'm sitting, paying attention, taking notes, and Ryan is sitting next to me on Twitter. And he's taking the link on YouTube of this, this song, I'm Ready, that we put out. And he's tweeting it out to, you know, a hundred different celebrities from Miley Cyrus to Justin Bieber. And the very last one we did, or he did, was Sia. And Sia was the only one who responded and said, I love this. She retweeted it. And she said, come downtown and meet me at my hotel. I want to meet you guys. And we thought we thought she was catfishing us. We thought it was like a fake account. This was before the point when she was wearing the, the um, you know, the bag over her head and before she had the wig. So we went down to her hotel and she walks literally out of her hotel singing our song and said, OK, let's go to brunch. And we went to brunch with Sia. And that was kind of the, the very beginning of it. She introduced us to people in the industry. We met what? with a few labels. I love Sia so much now. This is the greatest story of all time. <laughs> she's she's amazing because not only is she an amazing artist, she's an amazing writer. And she can get in the mindset of so many different artists and write songs based on their perspective. And that's one of the things that we really appreciated about her. This seems like a movie plot. This seems like, uh, you know, like uh, the end of a Disney movie, um, you know, where... Uh, 
um, SIA comes out and, and connects with people. Okay, so so let, let's go through some of the next things where, so then SIA introduces you to people at her label? Yeah, people at her label, people at other labels, and we have a whole bunch of label meetings. And every single one of them said, you know, this song is good, but we're going to put you in the room with really big writers like Max Martin and Dr. Luke, and they're going to write all your songs for you, and then you'll put them out. And we said, no, <laughs> we're, we're definitely uninterested in that. And then we met our manager, who she also introduced us to, and his name is Steve Greenberg. And he said, I really like what you have because it doesn't sound like anything else on the radio. And he said it was it was something that was unique because we made the entire record in that dorm room. We in our a mix between our parents' living room and that dorm room. It didn't sound professional. It didn't sound like it was made in a recording studio. And he said that's what made it stand out. And so we ended up staying independent and not doing a, a record deal. We did a deal with him and started our own company called AJR Productions. That sounds like such a risk, man. Like, I feel like any artist, you show up and they're like, okay, we're going to do this thing and here's some producers and here's some writers and we can work with this. And then you were like, no. <laughs> where, where, where? <laughs> and that, that seems incredibly ballsy. It was so risky and basically it was choosing between do we believe in ourselves and the vision that we have for this? Or do we want to take the big check right now, but have to completely change everything about us? There's something really important about that story, Adam, um, because I feel like the vast majority of humans in that situation would have been like, well, these are professionals. They know better than us. Like, they, you know, like they know how to make hits. They've got a bunch of platinum records on the wall. We don't have shit like that. Like, you know, like, like, let's get in there and like see what we can do together like that. Uh, like what percentage of artists do you think would have had that attitude? I feel like you know, 85% would have gone that direction, uh, I think. Um, were you getting advice from other people during this time? I guess your parents were like, you do you, or like, but like, was there, were there musicians? We didn't know anybody. The only person we knew that was like actually in the music industry was Sia at that point. And we'd known her for like a week. So we didn't have anybody <laughs> giving us advice. And we just said, look, you know, we've taken skills that we've gotten from you know, learning music, but then we've also taken skills from, I studied business at Columbia. So I was like, okay, let me think through this from a business perspective. Do we want to give up all our rights to everything for this check that could end up being really small in the long run? Or do we want to try, because Sia really liked the song, let's see if other people really like the song, like radio stations. And it ended up paying off. All right. Okay. So you turned down this, this label deal, but yeah. you hook up with Sia's manager. Um, Sia introduced us to our current manager. It wasn't her manager, but it was this guy manager. she knew and her manager knew because he did Hanson and he did the Jonas Brothers. There, there is something about like the, the three brothers uh, band. I mean, I can't believe he did Hanson and the Jonas Brothers. Holy shit. He like specializes in like freaking brother bands. I wonder if he, do, he just does brother bands. He'd be like, if there aren't three brothers, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> No, the, the other the songs that you, that you would know that he uh, he did who let the dogs out, and it's actually his voice on the record that's the dog barking. Um, he did uh, Stacy's wow. mom, Stacy's mom, a huge you know hit. He's oh, done a lot hit, of those yeah, like, of weird songs. So he becomes your manager, and then you're like, we're gonna go off on our own. So then what? Then our manager sits down and plays our song called I'm Ready for a guy named Kid Kelly. And Kid Kelly was the you know head of Sirius XM Hits One, which is the biggest pop station in the country on, on satellite radio. And he fell in love with it. And so immediately he started playing the song even before the song officially came out on iTunes, which was crazy. Then when the song came out on iTunes, and this was pre-streaming being the majority of what happens in the music industry, he started playing the song on, on Sirius XM and it just exploded. It was doing, you know, up to 50,000 copies a week on iTunes, which is a lot for, for iTunes. If you do 50,000 copies a week, I think it was 99 cents. So it's called $50,000 of which the artist sees how much? Yeah, it's a good question. So at that point, we had done a partnership distribution deal with Warner Brothers Records. So we retained all the rights to everything and we contracted them to work it to radio after Sirius XM had so much success. 
And so it was only worth going to somebody like Warner Brothers after we had proof that the song was going to do well. So Sirius XM was our test case. Then we brought it to Warner and said, look, the song is doing well. And so they worked it to radio, but it was still underneath our own label, AJR Productions. But to answer your question, it was a joint venture with them. So any profits off of that one specific song were split 50-50. And so how much of the, let's call it 99 cents, like uh, went to you and your brothers? So of the 99 cents, um, distribution costs, let's call it a dollar for easier math. Distribution costs, let's say it's about 20 cents um, for the cost of distributing the record. So we're down to 80 cents. Um, Since it doesn't cost that much to actually, you know, put a song out, half of that would go to Warner and half of that would go to us. So we're at 40 cents at that point. Um, Our lawyers take a piece of it, our business managers take a piece of it, our manager take a, takes a piece of it. So at that point, we're probably down to um, somewhere around 25 cents for the three of us to split. This episode of Yang Speaks is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I freaking love this stuff. I literally just took some. Athletic Greens, it's this wonderful, magical green powder. You can get a big like container of it or you can get a little mini pouches for traveling and you scoop it or you open the pouch and put it in some water, mix it up, drink it. It tastes great. One tasty scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend and more. They all work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet and give you a little energy, which I love, and focus, um, and also aids with digestion, supports a healthy immune system, all without the need to take multiple vitamins and crap like that. So it's very cool, very efficient, and very tasty. Um, And plus, right now, our audience is getting a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So here's the deal. Visit athleticgreens.com slash yang. So join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world who are making a daily commitment to getting their health better every day. So again, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash yang. Get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Do it. So you have this this hit on... Sirius XM uh, and on iTunes. Um, did you have an entire album at that point or like you had this one hit song or yeah, what comes next? It was one song and the song came and went and we didn't have enough material to put out an album. So the song, you know, it died. It was, it did well and then it died. And then eight months later we put out an album and by all measures, the album was not a success. It was <laughs> this not is so successful. interesting. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we no TV shows invited us to perform any of the singles from the album um, when the album came out, and we ended up getting out of the deal with Warner because we said, "Look, if you're not going to work another single to radio, let us go, and we're going to do you know our own thing." And wow, they were actually really nice about it, and that never happens. You know, labels wow. will buy up a contract and then they'll shelve somebody that's not that's not working, but they were gracious enough to let us go, and then we decided to continue writing and continue putting out music until we found that next song that was really starting to connect. Interesting. <laughs> so, so at this point, you're a college graduate. Are you back at home? Like your brother is uh, an undergraduate. Your younger brother's in high school, I guess. So like uh, you guys are you're at home and, um, you know, and then you're like, all right, guys, let's make an album. Let's make another hit song. We've proven we can do it once. Like now we got some stuff to work with. That was that was exactly the mentality. You know, we've built this fan base. Oh, in during that time, we tried to go on tour and having one hit song that goes platinum does not mean does that not you can go a tour on tour. Make. <laughs> nope, not at all. We like we played Albany, for example, 12 people showed up. Literally 12 people showed up to the venue off of a song that was everywhere and sold, you know, or had a million downloads. Um, So we said, you know, let's figure out how do we change the writing style of our music to make it so that when people hear the song, they'll want to see who's singing the song. Because that didn't happen with our first song. Our first song was more of, you know, a big generic party song. 
And we wanted the next one that got big to be something a little bit deeper that people cared about who we were, who the artist was that was singing it. And that was the approach we took with the next few songs. And the first song we did of that um, of that era was a song called I'm Not Famous. I'm Not Famous was recognizing like, we're nobody. We can walk down the, on the, down the street and no one's going to know who we are, even though we had a platinum record. And that's that's just, it is what it is. And those kind of more, slightly more complex, but also connectable lyrics are the things that really started to grow our fan base, our social media. And then the song Week came out. Go ahead and sing a, a couple bars from uh, Week so that someone can, because everyone's heard this song. Go ahead. But I'm weak. And what's wrong with that? Boy, oh boy, I love it when I fall for that. I'm weak. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, you can sing that part. I'm not singing that part. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I did a bad job of it. So, um, so, so, week comes out. Uh, how long is it between "I'm Ready" and "Week" coming out? And was "Week" like the next major tentpole? Yeah, that was the next major tentpole, and it, it was at least a year and a half, if not two years, between. So you're in the lab for like you know 16 months or whatnot. In those few years the entire industry shifted. I know. I, I I mean, I remember paying 99 cents for iTunes songs I liked, and then all of a sudden that, that went away. <laughs> so, so yeah, what's the new model? Yeah, the new model was streaming. And Spotify connected to Week so hard that it was on every single playlist. We were the cover of you know most of their playlists. And I think now it has over 500 million streams on Spotify alone. All right, man. So let's do some back of the envelope shit again. So, <laughs> so, so like, so let's say Andrew Yang comes up with some really like catchy ditty and then I put it on Spotify and it gets like a million streams. Like how much money do I realize? Because my sense of things is that I get like a, a minuscule amount of money per stream and that you have to get into like some crazy number in order for it to yeah, add up. Yeah, you're going to get around four tenths of a cent per stream. I, I will actually share a story uh, and, and like uh, as a media, um, you know, I'll, I'll share my experience um, with something called writing a book. <laughs> It's like the way I can relate to aspects of this. So, um, so it was in 2012, I was named one of Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business, which at the time was like, you know, like, like very, very awesome. Uh, and then from that, a uh, literary agent named uh, Bird Lavelle uh, reached out to me, uh, took me out to lunch and said, hey, you should write a book. And uh, Bird Lavelle is like a really handsome, well-dressed guy. He's like the kind of guy, like, you know, smiling, positive. Um, and, and so like having a literary agent, like take you out to lunch and say, write a book, you're like, wow, like I feel so special. And Bird, Bird's uh, like generally a great guy. We're friends this day. Um, but then at the time I was like, yeah, write a book, like seems hard. Like, I don't think, I, don't, I was running a nonprofit at the time. Um, uh, and I was like, I don't know if it's really gonna drive value for the nonprofit um, in the way that I'd hope. And then, um, but then like I, I decided to explore it uh, with Bird when I realized I was like, well, maybe it would drive the nonprofit. Um, and so uh, with Bird's help in a big way, um, you know, we write a proposal, uh, shop it to some um, uh, publishers, and then uh, HarperCollins ends up, I got a few offers, but the most serious one was from HarperCollins. And so HarperCollins did something close to what that record label did, where it's like, here's an advance, here's some amount of money, write the book. And then uh, the amount of money I got per copy of the book uh, was like a buck 50 for a book that, uh, you know, retailed for, I don't know, like $25, $26. Um, and the and the buck 50 I was getting like goes against the advance. Um, so, uh, I, I was paid, um, you know, what felt like a lot of money at the time, um, because I was like, well, I'm like, you know, first time author, like the fact that they were willing to pay me $55,000 to write a book was like, great. <laughs> uh, you know, was, and then like the book sell and then people are like, oh, I make a lot of money on that book would be like, actually like, you know, I haven't made anything because uh, after the advance, because, you know, you'd have to sell through a lot of copies in order to, for, uh, to get through the advance. And then, you know, my agent who deserved every penny, you know, like got a cut of that 55,000. And so, you know, I, I made like a bit of money, um, which I was again, very grateful for. Um, so, so there, so that was my experience with like kind of the unit, uh, marginal revenue for the creator. 
um, for doing something that some people would consider very significant, which is like, you know, write a book, which you know, is generally quite time consuming and the rest of it. Honestly, we wished we'd written music a few decades ago because when a song was a hit, people had to buy the entire album in order to that. get the one song. I would love to have done that, Adam. I'll have you know, I bought singles for all sorts of songs. I went out there and I bought that Wham! single. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> The, the success of one song does not a millionaire make, even close. Um, and so we started kind of moving into other areas of the music industry, and we really started to develop our touring base um, because that song, Week, was the song that people said, I really like the song, but I want to know who the artist is that's singing it. And so we put a tour on sale, and, you know, in each city, three to 500 people came out and we did, you know, the 30 major cities in the U S and that those three to 500 people were our first like core fan base. And we, we keep the same mentality now when we're putting together a show, but even then when we had a $0 budget for touring and we were in, you know, a minivan, we said, how do we make a show that's unlike anything else that's out there in, the, in, in music. And how do we make a show that'll make all 300 of those people tell two friends so next time it'll be, you know, 900. Wow. So awesome. So you go on the tour, you've seen the, the entire country then, uh, you know, with your brothers. You guys must get along really well because like being in a freaking tour van, uh, you know, for weeks on end, uh, I've done versions of that. And you really have to love each other. Heck, even if you love each other, you hate each other sometimes because you're just like, oh, man, like, that's super irritating. <laughs> the rest of it. Yeah. We grew up in a tiny apartment in New York City. The three of us shared a room for, I mean, until I went to college. And we had three bunk beds. It was a lower bed, an upper bed, across to another bed, and then a desk below. So we were forced to get along. Our parents just made us get along. So I guess there are benefits to, you know, living in a tiny space. <laughs> well, you guys clearly do get along, uh, which is great. It's one thing I love about the brother band thing is because, you know, with the normal band, like people break up sometimes, you know, it's hard to like, uh, like not let egos get in the way and all that. Uh, but brothers, it's like, well, can't break up with your brother. <laughs> 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 so your brother is unlike you have to drop out of college to do this thing. Are your parents like uh, hesitant on that level? I mean, you know, you guys were moderately successful, but it's still a kind of a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, they really did not want my brothers to stop going to school. <laughs> really didn't. And honestly, after we did that tour uh, that, that week was attached to, they wanted to go back to school too. So after Ryan, did, Ryan had done one semester, Jack was applying to Columbia a couple years later. And then after we went on that tour... Jack did his first semester at Columbia and Ryan went back and did another semester at Columbia, not because they really cared about the school itself, but they wanted to be inspired for writing more music. So they took courses and things that were just interesting to them. So Ryan took like an evolutionary biology class, you know, just because he cared about that subject, not that he would major in it or anything. So, so guys, if you heard some weird song about evolutionary biology from AJR, you know where it came from. They got a lot of inspiration from observing their friends going to parties saying, okay, what do these kids care about? What do people in college care about? And and that <laughs> what is do what these kids care about? <laughs> the entomologist, they got the notebook. Hmm. <laughs> a lot of it was about, you know, I'm in college. Am I a kid? Am I an adult? In what context am I still a kid? In one context, am I an adult? How do I relate to other people around me? What am I going to do when school is over? Those kinds of themes. Tell us about like the next number of years. And even I'm going to, to ask you about like the new album because you guys uh, came up with a, a new album quite recently. The process of writing our last few albums and this newest one has been what is this going to look like when we perform it on stage? Because after growing our fan base to a size where we were playing for, you know, a few thousand people in each venue, that was the thing that we loved doing the most. You know, hearing people sing the words back to us, meeting people saying, oh, this song did this for me or this song changed my life. That's that's why we do it. We want to express things that, that we've gone through in our lives. And hopefully it's both specific and general enough that other people will relate to it. And that 
energy of being in a crowd is why we do what we do. So it's always been about let's create the music, but at the same time, let's think about how it's going to translate to the live stage. And this newest album, OK Orchestra, was was really tough because the whole thing was written during a global pandemic, the pandemic obviously. Yeah. So when when are we going to go on tour? And we waited to put it out until we knew when we were actually going to go on tour. And we announced the tour and we put the tour on sale. And in the first weekend alone, more people bought tickets for that tour than our entire previous tour over the course of the in, in the entire tour. Congratulations, man. Everyone loves you. More people have discovered you. Like that has been a, like a lot of pent up um, demand. Uh, that That's amazing. You know, I love what you just said um, because it, it clearly defines a hierarchy of experience. Um, and so you have like, hey, you've got the your, your song and video on YouTube and you perform it on TV as like one level, but you're like, no, I really want people to come uh, to the concert to experience it live. And oh, by the way, I love performing our songs live about like a thousand times more than, uh, <laughs> than the other things that, that we do. Um, I'm going to compare this once again to running for president in a particular way, which is uh, at the height of the campaign, we would have rallies of thousands of people. And there was so much energy, there was nothing like it. You go out there and there'd just be like thousands of people that were fired up about, in our case, universal basic income and humanizing the economy and like a different form of politics and whatnot. And there was it was incredible, incredible. Um, my favorite part of the campaign, bar none, for sure, was like was doing those kinds of events. Um, Certainly in our case, like it wasn't the same where it's like it wasn't that somehow our campaign was like, you know, <laughs> like experience the campaign live. Like it wasn't like that. It was like we we're just trying to get, you know, <laughs> like try to get votes. You know? <laughs> but but uh, but it's something I can completely relate to that there is no experience like connecting to an audience live, particularly if you know that your work is important to them. Definitely. And we still do, you know meet and greets and other things to connect with fans. And even during the the pandemic, we did as many digital performances as we possibly could. We did a drive-in show last August where people came with their cars. We performed. You couldn't hear anything out of the speakers, but the music was sent through a specific uh, uh, radio frequency. Yeah. And, you know, anything to give people that sense of um, uh, connection or live experience during a time when, you know, we were all cut off from each other. So... You have this tour coming up. You've also become an environmental activist and you're pursuing your doctorate, which seems, which impressed me a lot. Um, and we were joking about your dissertation um, and that uh, you, you were joking that, uh, you know, when you finish your dis dissertation, maybe you'll like cut your hair or do something very dramatic. So, <laughs> so what, so what is your dissertation in? And by, by the way, like uh, my brother's uh, an academic like the dissertation really does seem like a major, major life event slash milestone. Like if you get that thing done, it's like, oh, like this entire like weight lifts and the rest of it, because it's the first time you have to produce some substantial original academic research that's like, you know, like uh, like at a level where people are like, this actually is new. This is like a real contribution. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so yeah, tell, tell us about what you're working on um, intellectually and academically in, in your activism. Yeah, so... I am writing my dissertation on the relationship between human rights law and sustainable development. And that Wow. <laughs> it it sounds crazy that you know everything we just talked about for the last I don't know how long it's been was all music related. But then this is something that I spend a lot of my time working on. And to to kind of get into a little more detail about it, if you think about it this way, there are development projects around the world that are specifically focused on clean energy, and they're amazing. There are wind farms, solar farms, hydroelectric plants, and they're great. But at, at their core, they're still capitalist enterprises. And there are a lot of multinational corporations that are providing this great clean electricity to millions of people, but still removing indigenous populations from their land, contaminating water and food supplies, and inhibiting their cultural practices. So my, my whole kind of pitch is that as we are moving in this sustainable direction, 
we need to ensure that we're binding human rights obligations to this future that we're creating. We need to make sure that we're protecting the human side of what we're doing in addition to protecting the planet. Because now we have the ability to rewrite the rules from scratch. If we're starting from, from zero and saying, okay, we're going to move our entire world to renewable energy resources, let's say at this time, as we're going in that direction, to ensure that humans are really being protected from the ground up. Well, there's nothing more fundamental as a human, right, than having clean air, clean water, like a decent environment and the, and, and the rest of it. Um, so I love the fact that you're trying to tie together human rights law uh, and sustainable development. Uh, it makes perfect sense, though I can see why right now they're not tied together. Um, so this this work of yours is awesome. And you have a podcast uh, and other resources that are dedicated to this, right? Yeah, yeah. So this started about, I don't know, two or three years ago because I was studying this and I had the platform of music, the UN reached out, specifically the UN Development Program. And they said, will you come on board and help us to amplify our messaging around sustainability? And I said, sure. And so, you know, we did some radio campaigns and some TV events and they said, okay, let's formalize this relationship. So I founded a nonprofit called Sustainable Partners, Inc. And what it does is it, it, it kind of creates bridges between areas that are, have been separate in the sustainability space. So for example, academia has traditionally been very separate from the advocacy and activism world. So what we do is we have a fellowship program that brings together academics and activists and encourages them to work together. So we develop high level research, but at the same time, turn it into consumable content and actionable actionable work for, for people to take. Um, you mentioned the podcast, it's called Planet Reimagined. And for everybody who subscribes, we plant a tree. So we try wow. and take those little incentives and build them into everything that we're doing. Academics plus activists sounds awesome. I mean, there's so many talented ac academics that no one, frankly, knows about <laughs> or that, that work. You know, because academics are generally very, very nerdy and wonky. And, uh, you know, like they write something that's going to get read by like 80 people. And, you know, I mean, no offense, because, again, my brother is, is an academic. And um, actually, it's kind of my family's business. Like my uh, father is now a retired professor um, after being in industry, my uncle's a uh, professor, uh, my grandfather was a professor. So, uh, you know, it's like, so I get it. I mean, I love that stuff. But like connecting them to activists is um, is really uh, potentially powerful. That That's great. You know, the academic world has this allegiance to tradition that is hard to overcome. And, you know, it's these boards of trustees and these investments. It is a very, very hidebound industry. Like it's it's not great that way. But, you know, honestly, there are a lot of amazing young people who have come up with really creative ways to communicate about environmentalism. And, you know, TikTok and Instagram have become great ways to educate yourself, albeit at a relatively surface level, not what you're going to get in academia. But if there was a bridging of those two spaces, I mean, think, think about the, the vaccine. At the very beginning, nobody really understood what this vaccine was. Nobody really understood what mRNA was. If there was this bridging between academia and young communicators and activists that could make people aware, this is what it is. This is what you want to put in your body and get this vaccine. We would have, I think, had a lot more people adopting sooner. And even now, a lot more people much more willing to get the vaccine. So there's that, that missing link between the high level science and then the people who are able to communicate it. Well, let's work on that, man. Let's get more people vaccinated 100%. So you've got an upcoming tour, Sustainable Partners, the Planet Reimagined podcast. You've got a lot going on. What are the, the thing uh, coming up that you're most excited about? I can't wait to get my PhD done. I am in footnote and citation mode now. I just wow. can't wait that for that, that to be is off that, of my plate. Look at you, man. It's around the corner then if you're in footnote and citation mode. Well, Adam, it's such a pleasure connecting with you. I learned a ton. Um, uh, I liked you before this convo, but I find you to be an even more uh, inspirational pillar now than before. You're a world-class creative. Uh, you're uh, on your way to being a world-class activist. Um, really, uh, man, congratulations. And let's, let's catch him on tour. Uh, the, I haven't actually seen them live yet. I'm going to change that soon. We'll make that happen. I'll make sure to send you tickets. <laughs>